one of the first proofs that you'll probably have to do in your discrete math course is proving that two sets are equivalent. Uh, for example, at the top here, we might have to prove that De Morgan's law holds. So we usually shorten this as DEM, and you might be thinking, well, how can I do that? Because normally we just use a set law or we use a Venn diagram and then we're done. But instead, what you're supposed to do is prove it step by step using what's called a direct proof. So you would show that if you have x in this set, then x would be in the other set on the right, and vice versa. And usually that's a pretty tough place to start. So we're going to go step by step on what each step means in terms of regular languages. We'll do some examples, and by the end of this video, this proof will be very easy for you. Okay, so it's good to remind ourselves of the actual language of set theory and what things mean. So if we have a set A, we can say that, okay, X is an element of that set, and with a picture, usually what that means, I'll use a different color for this, is that we have some element X right in there. So this is a really easy thing to work with. Uh, what's more interesting is when we get into things like the complement of A. Uh, you might see this as A bar, or maybe A C, or A with a little prime symbol above it. And what this means in here is that you have A inside the circle and you have the complement of A outside. So X is in this outside set, an A complement. Now what this means in terms of set proofs is two things. It can mean that X is an element of A complement. And alternatively, it could also mean that X is not an element of A. So we can use these two facts when looking at, say, A complement as a set. Okay, if we take a look at A union B, well, what does this mean? This means that X, we take a look at A and B, we have our element X somewhere, uh, it can be in any of these spaces. So in natural language, we would say that X is an element of A, or X is an element of B. And then in a set theory proof, normally you have two different paths to go down. You have a path to consider, what if X is an A? Uh, what if X is in B? And normally you split at that point. We have a intersection B. So in terms of the language here, let's say we have our two sets A and B. We know specifically that X is going to be right in the center portion. So I should really just draw it right in here. And the language we use for this is we say that X is an element of A and X is an element of B. That's how we can think of things in natural language. Uh, the last one, which is A minus B, or the difference of A and B, uh, sometimes you'll read it like this, sometimes you'll see it as a uh, right slash. We draw our two sets A and B here. Uh, it means that X is in A, but X is not in B, so X specifically is in this part somewhere. So specifically, we can rewrite this as X is an element of A, and X is not an element of B. So now that we know how to take these signs and convert them into natural human language, uh, we can start working with proofs piece by piece. So let's start with something relatively simple. Let's prove that the intersection of A and B is a subset of A union B. Okay, so how do we do a direct proof with this? Well, we need to have a starting point. And if we're ever doing a subset proof, we always want to make an assumption about the left-hand side. And we want to say something like, okay, suppose X is an element of A intersection B. So let's say that X is on the left. Now we're going to prove, using natural language and breaking down the sets, that X is going to be on this side as well. X is going to be an element of A union B. So let's think back to the language. Uh, if X is an A intersection B, there's a way we can break this down. We can say, then X is in A, and X is in B. Okay, so we need to get to the fact that X is in A union B, and we know that this means or. So we should take one of these two, it doesn't really matter which one we take, but we should take it to the next step. So then we can say, um, if X is in A, then we know so I'll just write this out in all language, then we know that X is an A or X is in B. So, because X is an A or X is in B, 
we know that x is an element of a union b because this is just taking the natural language and then converting it back into set theory. And this would be the end of the proof at this point. So a little bit daunting at first, but there's not too many things we could do. Uh, alternatively, if we chose x is equal to b, or x is in b, sorry, uh, we could do the same step as before. If x is in b, then we know that x is in uh, b, or x is in a. So whenever we have something just on its own, we can always do or with any other set, because or just requires that it's in one of those two. Okay, and uh, just to confirm that this works, we can always draw pictures. So we know that x is in the center of these two sets. Let me just draw these a little bit bigger. Here's a, here's b. We know that x is in there because x is in a and b. And here's what x, uh, here's what a or b is, a union b. It's in the whole thing. So if x is in the middle, if x is at a and b, then obviously x is in a or b. Okay, that's the first one. Uh, let's do one that's a little bit more complicated. So again, uh, this is a nice subset proof. So what we're going to do is we're going to make an assumption. We're going to assume that x is in that left side set. So let's assume that x is in a minus b intersection c. So there's a lot more going on here, but it's just going to be the same thing. We're just breaking apart the language in the sets. So if x is in a minus b and c, Remember, we can say that x is in A, and x is not in the minus set. So, and x is not in B intersection C. Okay. So, we want to get that x is in this set over here, A minus B union A minus C. And this looks nothing like what we have so far. So, we're going to have to be a little bit clever with this right side. So let's think about this. Um, we're saying that x is not in B intersection C. So what this means is that x could be over here in B, or x could be over here in C, or if we think about the entire universe, uh, x might be anywhere outside of it. So what we do know is that from this, x is going to be in the complement of b, so that's everything outside of b, or x is going to be in the complement of c. In other words, it's going to be in something outside of c. So uh, to draw this in a picture, just so we can really understand what this means, and I'll draw this again with b and c, and the outline, if x is in B complement, this means it's somewhere here. So I'm just trying to fill in all of this area here. So we can see it's not in that center point. It's not in this B and C area. And if we think about X being in C complement, that means it's uh, somewhere in one of these areas. So you can see the only thing that isn't covered is B and C, which is exactly what we want because we don't want X in there. Okay, so I'm gonna keep this over from the last time, X is in A and X is in B complement or X is in C complement. Okay, fantastic. Uh, now, what can we do? Well, again, we're trying to get A minus B or A minus C. So if we know that x is in A and x is in one of those sets, we can distribute this with natural language. We can say that x is in A and x is in B complement, or x is in A and x is in C complement. So one of those will be true. Okay, well, what's really nice here is that we're just a couple steps away from taking a look at that top set and getting a match. So we could say x is in A and, remember another way to write this one, if x is in B complement, this means that x is not in B. So that's one condition. Or x is in A and, we can do the same thing with x is in C complement. That's the same thing as saying that x is not in C. 
Okay, if we bracket this off and we take a look at the thing we're trying to prove up top, maybe we can see a similarity now. So now that we have x is in a and x is not in b, we can transfer this over and say x is in a minus b, because this is just the definition, or x is in a minus c, because again, we have that same definition there. And now we can take this natural language or, and we can combine these two. We can say x is in a minus b, or is the same thing as union, and x would be in a minus c there as well. So now we've proven that if x is in this set, a minus b intersection c, then it follows that x is in this final set, a minus b union a minus c. And this is exactly what we wanted to prove up top. So this one was more complicated, but we're just taking the language that we used in that first list in the first slide and breaking it down to do this. So just step by step, piece by piece, uh, it worked out. So let's go back to this original question. Let's prove De Morgan's law. And what we notice is that we have an equality sign. So we need to do two things. We need to prove that the complement of A union B is a subset of A complement intersection B complement. And we also need to prove the reverse, that A intersection B complement is a subset of A union B complement. So let's call this one, let's call this two, and let's start with one. So what we'll do is we're going to assume that X is on that left side. So X is an element of A union B complement. So if X is an A union B complement, this then means that X is not in A union B. And if X is not in A or X is not in B, in natural language we can write this as X is not in A and X is not in B. So these two are the same thing. X is not in A or B is the same thing as saying X is not in A and X is not in B. Okay, well this is nice. So if X is not in A, that's the same thing as saying X is an A complement. And if X is not in B, that's the same thing as saying X is in B complement. Oh, if I take a look at the top of the page, I'm just one step away from putting it back into set theory. So then we can say that X is in A complement intersection B complement. All we've done is we've taken this and and converted it into intersection. Okay, so that's one direction. What's nice about this is that we can really just go in the opposite direction if we wanted to. So uh, for simplicity, we could say if we start at two, we work all the way back up to one backwards, uh, but let's just do it piece by piece anyway. So I think I can fit this on the right side of the screen next to the original. So let's just keep everything on the same page. In fact, let's just use a different color so we don't get these confused. So I'm going to assume for number two that X is in A complement intersection B complement. Okay, so that means that X is in A complement and X is in B complement. Okay, so this means in this case uh, that X is not in A and X is not in B. So if X isn't in either A or B, then we can write that. X is not in A union B, which means that X is in A union B complement. So we've now proven both sides. So we should complete this and say, uh, therefore, uh, A union B complement is equal to A complement intersection B complement. So we had to do both ways because we're looking for equality and all these give us our subsets when we go from one to the other. Okay, so I wanna do one more question with you and try to beat you or try to beat me if I can. <laughs> and try to beat me if you can. So if A is a subset of B, then A minus C is a subset of B minus C. So this one again is not too challenging, but if this is the first time you're doing it, uh, this is a good exercise. So we're given this information. This, this is true. We can use this as a fact. So what we wanna do is we wanna prove that A minus C is a subset of B minus C. 
So I'm going to start with an assumption and assume that x is in that set. So I will assume that x is an element of a minus c. Okay, so natural language just means that x is in a and x is not in c. Okay, that's good. Um, but now, what do we do? Somehow we have to get b and not c. So really what we want in our step is we want to get to this step, x is not in c and x is in b. Well, we can use this fact here. Since we know that a is a subset of b, this tells us that x is in a means x is in b. So this is our bridging step. So because x is in a means that x is, e, x is in b, then we can go to this step right here, x is in b and x is not in c. Therefore, x is an element of b minus c. So we have our assumption here, x is in a minus c, and we've gotten to the fact that x is in b minus c. Therefore, this whole thing has been proven. So hopefully you can do some set theory proofs now. I'll have another video with Cartesian products and power sets, uh, but this is a great place to get you started. And if you have any problems again, just ask below and I'm sure someone or me or another commenter is happy to answer you.